do you enjoy life as a freelancer? Uh, yes and no. Um, no, because you lose the comforts of things like sick pay. Obviously, if you're off sick, you don't get paid. That's harsh. If you take a holiday, you're not getting paid. But which kind of meant quite often, I mean, I, mean, I have booked a holiday to actually to go away soon. But you, you end up like thinking, oh, I could, should I just work through and earn some more money um, rather than take a holiday? But you do need to take a break at some stage. But I think being freelance, you do tend to sort of say yes to more things and end up doing kind of more than you should do. I mean, I did a 13 day in a row stint around Cheltenham recently, which kind of took it out of me. But when I finished the last Saturday night, I remember I thought, wow, that was, that was tough in the end. Um, although a lot of my job is fun, so it's not like, going and plastering walls or building houses or my dad was an electrician it was like proper you just do proper work and it's not like that is it it's more like more of a hobby but um i think you do tend to do more work being a freelancer sometimes than you probably should um but obviously you don't get paid but then it's good in a way that you can sort of pick and choose can't you as well things if like you can take certain days off if you need to and obviously it's hard work sort of keeping your own accounts and things like i've got a good accountant does a lot of that but um You've got to obviously keep records of things and keep receipts of expenses and things like that. It's kind of, I'm not always the most organised at things like that. But um, no, it's kind of, it's it's good in a way because you can kind of say, oh, like uh, Sam's birthday coming up and things like I say, no, I'm not working over that weekend and things like that. So that's good. Do you ever feel tested still or out of your comfort zone? You're such a pro and so much experience now, a real natural TV person. But do you ever feel nervous or, or yeah, you know, definitely. I think about anything? I think the first doing the first state side of on the new Sky Sports Racing on January the 1st, that was kind of, wow, this is the first ever state side live on the new channel. I've got to get this right. I can't mess up my intro. I can't mess up anything. So that was kind of crucial. Um, and just commentating as well. You just, you, you cannot get anything wrong. You can't sort of switch off for a minute or trying to do it sort of, you know, 50%. You've got to be bang on it all the time. You've got to be dialed in, um, sharp, so you can't ever switch off at commentate. But no, I'm definitely still testing commentating. I mean, I was doing... I was a commentator at Chepstow recently, and we had a sort of 16 run handicap chase over three and a quarter miles. You know, you can't you need to be on your game for those sort of things. You can't miss anything. You can't miss a fall, or you can't miss a horse pulling up. You, you can't miss things. Um, and even with working on Sky as well, we were covering French racing the other day, and we've covered like trotting racing, and not something I had a massive knowledge of or experience before. So I needed to do a bit more research. So yeah, I was definitely, definitely still tested by everything. Anything ever gone wrong? Oh yeah, a few times. Uh, Probably the most famous one that's probably watched a lot by the races viewers is the um, the Graham McDowell uh, mess up that I did. I remember working at Newcastle. I was presenting there throughout the races and interviewing a few. There was a big charity do on there. A few of the golfers were there. I think there was a big golf tournament going on there at the time. I think that um, that Graham Wiley sponsors and there was like Lee Westwood was in. There. I think Rory McIlroy was meant to turn up. Uh, Graham McDowell was there. A few football famous faces as well. So I was inter I did interview Terry McDermott, the former um, Liverpool and Newcastle uh, assistant manager and player. Um, obviously big name in football Terry good man so I did an interview with him and at the race we were just playing it out at the time because you know sometimes you record things it gets played out a few minutes later so they were playing out the Terry McDermott interview in my ear because I could hear it in my earpiece obviously and I went to interview and they said that like, anybody else there to get and I thought oh there's, there's GMAT there's Graham McDowell so you know Ryder Cup legend sunk the winning partner Ryder Cup for Europe won a US Open I thought yeah I'll go and get Graham so went up to him I go right we're rolling cue so I went Back here at Newcastle, I'm joined now by Ryder Cup legend Graham McDermott. And as soon as I said it, I realised that, oh no, it's, and, he, and he actually, Graham actually went, it's McDowell, by the way, and picked me up on it. And I was like, yeah, of course it is. And then I called him G-Mac and tried to make a joke of it. And I, and I was sort of hoping that we, I could do it again. So could we do a take two? Um, they were like, no, 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 carry on, carry on. So I had to carry on knowing that they, they were going to stitch me up, especially with that horrible Jason Weaver and Luke Harvey in the studio. They were going to have a lot of fun with this and I knew what I'd done straight away but it was just because I was listening to the other interview and it's just like oh but no we, I mean f fair play to Graham he carried on and we kind of made a bit of a joke of it afterwards that I called him Graham McDermott foolishly even though he's like a, a golf legend um, especially for somebody who's meant to be a bit of a golf expert I really let myself down but no it was it was highly embarrassing but at the races made it made me pay for it by playing it out again and again I can't remember how many times I played it out that night and then when you know, I, was, I was doing the following, it was, it was the Saturday morning Greyhound show the next day with Hobsey and Steve Freeth, and they were yeah they were making fun of me as well. So there was there was no let up for about a week afterwards. You mentioned quite a few names there. You've worked with some fantastic people and, and real pros in the world of sport. Any stand out for you? Um, apart from yourself, obviously. Uh, <laughs> <Isn't it? laughs> um, no, I mean Greyhound racing. I mean I mean Hobsey's obviously the obvious one, isn't he? I mean, he's such a great guy to work with. Did, did four years with him on on Sky, um, and a lot of time. Of, 
the, the Saturday morning show as well. I mean, that, that lasted a good couple of years, didn't it? On at the races, we used to cover Toaster on a Saturday morning, which sadly obviously ended when Toaster closed last August. Um, but no, Hobbsy was great to work with. So many people in Greyhound racing and horse racing. You get to work with a lot of good people. Um, even the stateside racing, you get to work with a lot of good people. Um, and Jason Weaver, I mentioned there, obviously we won broadcast of the year, didn't he, last year, well deserved. And he was great when I was first started off. A lot of fun as well, likes to play a few practical jokes on you. He was always just trying to wind me up and stitch me up. But um, no, you can learn a lot from people um, across all, all sports, really. Horse racing and greyhound racing. I've learned a lot from great commentators I've worked with um, in the horse racing world and ex-jockeys, trainers. Yeah, Everybody has a bit of knowledge. If you can take one bit of knowledge from everybody you work with, I think you, you'll go a long way, I think. And there is a lot of fun to be had in, in the sorts of jobs we do. And I count myself personally very lucky to have had many great experiences along the way in my career. But what's up there for you as something that you feel lucky to have you know, been witness to or, or experienced? I think doing the last... Greyhound Derby final at Wimbledon was massive on Sky Sports um, that Saturday night. Um, I think that was amazing. Um, JT Jet, that that last one was was pretty big. It was such a great race as well, wasn't it? I felt sorry for Drippy's Roddick because I remember the connections coming over because it was a photo and you, you're you never quite short Wimbledon, are you? Unless you were on the line who's won. And that was just the buzz that night. I mean, the crowd was was amazing. I, I mean, people people knocked Wimbledon, didn't they, all the time, and facilities wise, and it was it was falling apart in all intents but and purposes. But the atmosphere was still there, mm. um, and I do miss that. I miss the, the Wimbledon Greyhound derbies. I know people said Toaster was great, and Toaster did a great job for two years, but something's gone with Wimbledon going that will never come back. And it's almost like a part of Greyhound racing died when Wimbledon closed a bit, especially for the derbies. Um, and that was yeah, that was special to do that. I was privileged to do, and also I, th I was commentating at Windsor when Richard Hughes had his seven timer, um, a good few years ago now. But that was massive. I mean, I think it made Sky Sports news. I mean, ITV played out as well on the news that night. My commentary was like, wow, I'm like, I'm, I'm glad I didn't mess up the last race and call it the wrong or the wrong winner or something. But yeah, that was good. So yeah, calling Richard Hughes his seven magnificent seven at Windsor was big, and I think that last Greyhound Derby at Wimbledon for Sky working there, presenting, fronting that coverage was. Probably the two the two highlights so far. You mentioned ITV using one of your commentaries. Do you have a desire to work for other channels, maybe do other sports? And and why is it so difficult for people in racing to cross over into other sports? Why does why do we not see more of it? I think we are seeing. I mean, I mean, John Hunt's probably the best example of it happening, isn't he? He's done so well for his BBC roles, Olympics, and what have you. And Claire Balding, of course. Yeah, Claire Balding, one. of course. But another it's not one. many, really, when you think no. how good and professional a lot of these racing presenters are. Yeah, like Ed Chamberlain, obviously, in front of the football, didn't he? He's gone the other way, but into racing now. Um, obviously, he's he's very good. It's hard, isn't it? I think almost sort of racing presenters get get labelled almost not quirky, but kind of a bit different, don't they? Got sort of get pigeonholed a bit as being kind of racing experts, and that's it. If you know about horse racing, you can't sort of know anything about anything else. But obviously, that's not the case. But um, yeah, you know, I'd love to get a chance eventually to work in other sports. But um, I'm happy for now working in in the horse racing industry. Do you think people get typecast into a gambling world? Is that something to do with it? Possibly, yeah. I think so. I think occasionally people think horse racing think it's, it's, it's all to do with betting, and it's. But then some of the people who work in horse racing, I mean, television-wise, not just presenting production-wise, are some of the finest, I think, in the industry, in the TV industry. Um, I think horse racing now, especially with Sky Sports Racing, take it to a new level. Um, I think the coverage is out there, isn't it, of, of, of high quality and hoping that maybe it will change and, and horse racing TV people get a chance to sort of spread to other sports and things. You've touched on ownership for yourself of horses and dogs. Have you ever been involved in any horse ownership or just no, greyhounds? No, never, never been rich enough to own a, a, a horse, Julie, sadly. But, four uh, children, you're probably yeah, not going to Yeah, four children, really so um, <laughs> no chance to own a, own a horse. But greyhound, I've had a few greyhounds, yeah. I mean, I first got, I was shown a greyhound called Beeville Pride at Crayford many years ago with a, uh, an old colleague of mine called Dean Goddard got me into it, who's um, doing very well now working for my racing, who was involved at the Racing Post as well. Um, yes, yeah, so we owned that dog. Then we owned dogs, dogs together. We owned uh, a dog called Good For Them, who Paul Young trained. Um, another couple of dogs with Paul Young as well. It was, it was the time when Paul Young was kind of really peaking with Drippy's Vieri. And we were kind of very much kind of little fish in the kennel at the time, but um, no, Paul was still very good with us. And then um, after that, kind of got involved with, with Cheers Tony, thanks to my good friend Tony Clark, who sort of... Um, Got involved, got me involved in that dog, and he kind of took me to the amount of people who come up to me at greyhound tracks, horse tracks as well, and say, "Oh, well, how's Cheers Tony?" He kind of got a bit of a, he became a bit of a star, didn't he? I think on the on the circuit with his his exploits, with the way he went from winning sprint sprint open races, and he was, I think he was he was on a big Sky Car when we were there once at Monmore and Hove, and he didn't quite win those, but he had a big fan club. He was a great dog, 
Um, and then after that, obviously Morning Live Len, who I'm with, involved with now with, with Daryl and Jonathan Hobbs and a few others, who's um, sadly off the track at the moment, but um, has won. I mean, Seamus and Teresa train him now and they've done really well with him. But uh, no, greyhounds only, never owned a horse. And you've got a real spot for Morning Live Len. Obviously, uh, at some point, his racing career will come to an end. Your youngest son, Sam, adores yeah. him when he goes to the kennels on a Sunday. Is there a place for him on your sofa, perhaps, one day? Uh, I'd say yes. It's up to Nicola, though, probably. <laughs> when when, when <laughs> we get a house. Partner, yeah. <laughs> when we when we, um, when we when we get our house, I think, maybe. But um, hopefully, we can put some photos in of Sam with, with Len and just get the rapport they get. Because we go and walk in, we try and get there once a month on a Sunday. And yeah, I mean... They've got a real rapport going on, little Sam and, and Morning Live Len. I mean, Lenny looks, he, he looks from him. He was so gentle with him as well. I remember once Sam was trying to feed him, he, we'd give him like a bit of sausage, a bit of cheese and ham, and Sam had the food kind of stuck between his fingers and he was trying to give it to Len. And Len was trying to eat the food out of Sam's hand without hurting him with his teeth. He was trying to sort of, trying to angle so he wouldn't hurt Sam. It was just so, such a nice sort of picture, like how, dog, how, how gentle the dog was being with the little, little boy. There was, of course, a horse racing called Enzo, but that's nothing to do with you? No, he was a, he was a horse um, trainer. My Ed Warco is a very good trainer, became a bit of a friend of mine last year with a horse. I remember being at Brighton and I was kind of covering the action there, commentating, and I was lucky enough to do an interview afterwards with Connections and I got to sort of meet the horse and give him a little pat. But yeah, he won. He, I seemed to bring him luck. Whenever I was at Brighton, he seemed to win Enzo. But he was, I'm Ed Walker mentioning he was going to the sales, but he was a bit out of my price range, sadly. But um, no, he wasn't He wasn't anything to do with me in terms of the ownership. But um, I'm, I'm, I sort of tell myself that the owner named him after me. I'm, I've, I've convinced myself that that's the case. Obviously, who knows what the future holds and maybe... Hopefully one day we'll see you on mainstream media, maybe not doing anything to do with racing, maybe something <laughs> else. But uh, up to this point, is it a, a life that you've enjoyed? In your oh, yeah, I've been very lucky um, to, to earn a living out of sort of working in broadcasting for the last, uh, I think it must be nearly 14, 15 years, as long as that. Um, I've been very lucky, obviously, I said, I mean, growing up, my dad, he was like, a, he was an electrician, he worked hard for the family to sort of provide and stuff. And I often think I'm kind of blessed and charmed really to be working in, a, in an industry where you kind of just sort of talk for a living and you get to like talk about horse racing and greyhound racing for a living was it's 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 definitely a good thing i've been very fortunate work with some great people um, but i'm always learning as well i mean i think every every time you even we work for sky greyhounds where well, you, you would learn something from that night that you didn't know that you could use in future broadcasts and even working with different commentators presenting as well you can pick up little bits all the time but no i've been very fortunate as i said it's not like hard graft is it really i mean you've got to obviously do you put your put your study in and turn up on time and, and know your colors and know your start know your subject but it's um, no i've been very lucky i think well on that note we'll leave it there thank you very much for telling us your story thank you julie pleasure